Why praise God? Why? Do you have the answer on the tip of your tongue? See, friends, we praise God because we were orphans spiritually and we were adopted into his family. We were lost and found. We were captives to our sinful nature, but set free. Psalm 100 is a psalm of thanksgiving and praise. It is a psalm that directly follows what's known as the enthronement psalms. Psalms like Psalm 43, 47, 93, 97 through 99. Like Psalms 100 is couched right in the section of Psalms within book four here that is directly following Psalms about God ruling and reigning on his throne, being enthroned in heaven. This is a psalm that teaches us how to praise God, how to worship God, and why we need to praise Him. This psalm does more than just tells us to sing. It tells us to serve the Lord with glad in sincere hearts. It corrects us here. It exhorts us to come ready when we come in the presence of God to to lift his name high and to magnify him, to put the spotlight on him. This psalm calls us to praise God because of his love, because of his faithfulness, and because of his goodness. You know, there are a lot of moments in life where we just don't feel like praising God. Maybe some of those moments in life have to do with defeat or discouragement or dissatisfaction, but I can tell you, friends, there's a a lot of enemies to praise. There are a lot of enemies out there of praise. One enemy is the enemy of criticism. Friends, you you can't praise God when you're being critical. Not when you're being constructive, but when you're being critical. Nobody meets your expectations. You'd rather talk about something or somebody instead of to them. If you find yourself being critical, if you find yourself speaking ill of something or someone and people are just nodding their head, that's a great indicator to you that they don't agree with you necessarily. And when you're critical, it's an enemy of praise. Uh, Think about that. Criticism makes you negative. It puts you in a bad environment. It doesn't lift others up. It points out problems. An enemy towards praise is criticism. Another enemy of praise that robs us of our praise is intentional sin. Yeah, intentional. You know better. You know good and well. You've been prompted by the Holy Spirit of God not to go down that road, but you find yourself headed that way anyway. What robs us of praise is that feeling of worldly sorrow we get when we're found out. That worldly sorrow that's not sorry for what I did, but sorry I got caught. And Thankfully, God provides through the conviction of the Holy Spirit a godly sorrow that can lead to repentance so that we don't feel the sting and the taste of death is produced by worldly sorrow. When we're stuck in intentional sin, it's very self-serving, and it's an enemy of praise. Another enemy of praise is just a lack of gratitude, a lack of thanksgiving and gratitude for what you have, your place in life, even the, the lot the Lord has assigned to you or allowed you to go through, a lack of gratitude for from the most simple of things to the most extravagant things in your life. A lack of gratitude will rob you of an opportunity to praise. But just as dangerous is the idea of mediocrity. That's an enemy of praise. I'm just going to go through the motions. I'm going to be mediocre about my love for God. My temperature for God, it's neither hot nor cold. It's that lukewarm that Revelation says God just wants to vomit out. Mediocrity. We need passionate believers 
who are ready to praise him. But if you're stuck in that lukewarm environment, you don't have any motivation to praise. You don't see the need to praise. Mediocrity is an enemy of praise. A major enemy of praise is spiritual lostness. Perhaps that should have been the first one that we list here today. But when you're spiritually lost, your worship goes towards other things than the one true God. You have not been convicted by the Holy Spirit. You have not been regenerated by God Almighty. You are stuck in your lostness and you see no one and nothing to direct your praise to other than yourself. So you serve those needs, wants, and desires. Spiritual lostness is an enemy to praise. Another enemy of praise is just a simple self-serving attitude. You could think about it this way. The church isn't meeting my needs. The preaching is not what I'm looking for. The worship need some improvement. There's not any programs for what I'm going through. I, 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 me, me, me. There's an old parody, Will, Weird Al Yankovic style that would sing, instead of it's all about you, Jesus, it's all about me. This idea of just a self-serving mentality robs you of praise because a self-serving mentality is an enemy of praise. I think another enemy of praise is a defeated attitude. Living in a defeatist mindset will rob you of praise. You're more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. You are a victor because of the Lord and what he has done. He rules and reigns. You don't have to have a defeated attitude or a defeatist mindset. But if you'll walk around with a woe as me mindset, it'll rob you from praise. It's a major enemy. The last few that I want to talk about is just a simple a lack of trust in God and faithlessness. I think they're tied together. They go hand in hand. You don't trust God so you won't be faithful to Him. You don't persevere. You don't endure. You're not resilient because you don't trust in the outcome that He has planned. You see, it's all of these things and more, many more, that stand in opposition towards a heart that's surrendered to the Lord, that's ready to praise God. You see, when you're caught up in categories like this, you don't see why you should turn your heart to the Lord. You don't see why you should bring songs of joyful shouting to the Lord. You find yourself focusing in on all of the wrong things and it crowds out any room in your life to praise God. But the Psalms is here, and Psalm 100 gives us why God should be praised and how we ought to go about praising Him. Let's look together in Psalm 100, verses 1 through 5. Five short and simple verses, full of power. It says, Let the whole earth shout triumphantly to God. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us. We're His. His people. The sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and bless His name. For the Lord is good. And his faithful love endures forever. His faithfulness through all generations. Wow, what a powerful five verses that teach us why and how we should praise the Lord God Almighty. But I can tell you, friends, that I've been in that place before where I've allowed an enemy of praise to attack me and even defeat me in those moments. I've found myself questioning what God is doing and what He's up to. And, and I have found that if I will turn my heart to the instruction from Psalm 100, if I will claim the promises here, 
if I will reframe why I'm going to church, what I'm doing at church, and how I should be acting before a holy and worthy God, that it changes me. It changes my mindset. It changes the path that I am on. It changes the direction of my life. And friends, it can do the same for you. God's Word is powerful and transformative. It's exposing and instructive. And if you will heed the instruction and you will allow the exposing of your sinfulness when it comes to praising Him, oh friends, it will inspire you and it will lift your spirits and it will change your direction. The first few verses here in Psalms 100, verses 1 through 5, they, they teach us about an attitude of gladness to the Lord, that we're to serve the Lord with gladness. And I don't know if you recognized here in this passage, in these short five verses that teach us about serving the Lord with gladness here and obeying Him in worship with thanksgiving. I don't know if you recognized, but there's not a question mark here. It's nothing but periods and exclamation points when it comes to punctuation. There are no question marks. There's no suggestions here. These are commands. There's no, hey, this would be nice if you considered this. No, this is a firm directive to us. Also, what we find here is there's no lamenting in this passage of Scripture. While we've seen many of the songs deal with a lament followed by a praise, this is simply a psalm of praise unto the Lord. It's a psalm of gratitude and thanksgiving to God, following a proper alignment mentally and understanding of who God is, being enthroned in heaven as the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the ruler of rulers. It's a great reminder to us that from an attitude of praise, we can discover the joy in, in sincere fellowship of Jesus. And what it teaches us here is a part of our worship and a part of our praise is actually our actions. We show our gratitude through worship and praise by serving the Lord with glad and sincere hearts here. While this psalm is very direct on what it tells us to do and leaves no wiggle room or wondering what we should do here, it's a very black and white psalm here. While it teaches us this principle, isn't it amazing how so many of us find ourselves wanting to be served. We want to be served from our friend group that doesn't call us from that new person in our lives or work environment that doesn't take that first step of introducing and making the relationship easy to begin. No, we want to be served in most areas of life. We're not looking on a regular basis to go get behind the cafeteria line, we want to be the ones being served, not doing the serving. But a heart that is really thankful displays through an act of worship unto God, it does it by serving the Lord with glad and sincere hearts. Look at verses 1 through 3 again. It says, let the whole earth shout triumphantly to God. Like it's a, a victory cry. It's a shout of praise. This is a declaration. You might be watching the World Cup and you see thousands erupt in shouts of praise when they simply kick the ball to another person on the field. I know, not even a goal. Oh, but when a goal happens, there's one step further. When the clock runs out, there is the shout of victory. They shout victoriously. They know who their Lord is here in verse 1. And as a result, they serve Him. They give their lives to it. They dedicate portions of their time to this idea of gratitude to the Lord by serving Him. And out of that glad heart that serves the Lord, they present joyful songs unto the Lord you know, these shouts of victorious triumph, they would take place oftentimes 
before an army of people would rush into battle against opposition and they were claiming the victory that they knew the Lord could give them. It was the signal that was used to get, commence an engagement with the enemy. I, I like that. This idea of shouting with praise victoriously comes at the beginning, not at the end. You might go be going through a battle and the Lord is working on your heart in a somewhat, and you need to claim this passage and you need to shout a victorious shout of, of victory and then you need to shout a song of praise to the Lord by serving God, right? You, these are actions that we do. We, we claim the victory in God and then we serve the mission we give our lives to it. This idea of serve here, it's a verb that means to, to work. It's action-oriented. How are you serving the Lord? How are you working on behalf of the Lord? Not working for God to get His favor, but no, you work for the Lord out of gratitude for the favor you've received and the victory that you've received. If you're in Christ, you've received salvation and you've got victory over the grave, victory over your sins, over that old sinful nature. It's all been replaced by a new nature in Christ, by a Holy Spirit indwelling in your body as the temple of the living God, by being brought into the family of God. Oh, that shout of victory that's happened in your life should lead you to serve the Lord, to view others as truly better than yourself. Not as a way of putting yourself down, but you're just treating others better than yourself. It's, it's a sign and act of humility to take up the servant's towel and serve one another. And in doing so, you will serve the Lord. In Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 12, they speak of this great celebration that takes place. And you'll see how they celebrate here as they're trying to rebuild the wall and bring back people out of exile. And look at the party that's taking place, the celebration around the victory that they are getting from the Lord. It says, then all the people began to eat and drink, send portions and have a great celebration because they had understood the words that were explained to them. Oh, when you understand the mission and you're a part of the mission and you're linking arms with others that are on board with the mission, it should lead to a celebration in your life. Serve the mission. And a part of serving with gladness is you know why you're doing what you're doing. Well, you're doing it because you acknowledge. You actually acknowledge something. You're acknowledging that the Lord is God. That's what the psalmist calls us to. He says, acknowledge that the Lord is God. In Psalm 100, verse 3, the ESV will use the version uh, and it will say, know that the Lord is God. But I really like the CSB here because it says, acknowledge that the Lord is God. You're, you're giving acknowledgement to. The word acknowledge, it's a verb that means, yes, to know, know that the Lord is God, but it means more than that. It means to learn, to perceive, to discern, to, to experience, to confess, to contemplate, to consider, to, to know people relationally is what it means to acknowledge, to know how to do something, to be skillful, to be made known, to make oneself known. These are all words that are used to give deeper meaning to this word acknowledge that the Psalms is used. And so all throughout the scripture, we see it used in these various ways. But for me, my walk away from this and my takeaway is this. I'm going to acknowledge the Lord by, I'm going to know that he's the Lord. I'm going to learn that he's the Lord God. I'm going to perceive that the Lord is God. I'm going to discern that the Lord is God. I'm going to experience in my life that the Lord is God. I'm going to confess that the Lord is God. I'm going to consider that the Lord is God. I'm going to acknowledge that the Lord is 
to God. How do you serve with a glad heart? You bring songs of praise to Him. You join the mission. You're on board. And you know why you do what you do. And what's foundational, understanding why you do. Why do you sing? Why do you worship God? Because you've declared something in your life that is known in this world, that He is the Lord God. And you are saying, I agree with that. He's revealed Himself that the Lord is God. And you acknowledge it. You know it. You've experienced it. You've learned it. You've processed that. Have you taken time to bend your knee to the Lord? Sometimes you hear the phrase, He's my Lord and Savior, right? Not only has He given me saving grace, but in repentance of my sin, in the posture of coming before Him, humbling myself before God, laying prostrate before Him, bending my knee to Him, I am declaring with my mouth and confessing that I agree with you, God, you are God. I am not have you done that in every area of your life? I'm certain that you have not because I know that I have not. Oh, yes, I strive for it, friends, but my actions tell me otherwise. My actions tell me otherwise. Oh, when I get caught up in those enemies of praise, they reveal to me that positionally I'm not acknowledging that the Lord is God. Because if I really acknowledged it, knew it, experienced it, believed it, why would I waste any time in my life in those areas that don't provide spiritual investment in this world, that provide no fruit? Why do we acknowledge that the Lord is God? The Psalms has said so. He says, well, you know what? Because uh, He made you. You're His. You're His people and you're the sheep of his pasture. The word here, pasture, this is a word that would describe just farmland. And in general sense, this farmland was meant for many sheep to come and use. It was open. It was property that could be freely used by the village. And the Lord is saying, hey, this, this pasture that is mine, it's free for you to come into and for you to find nourishment from refreshment from, enjoyment from, for you to be fed by. I made you, and I've got a place for you, and I've got a purpose for you in bringing glory to my name. We're in his pasture. It's his pasture, not yours. It's not somebody else's pasture. It's the Lord's pasture. And he gives us access to those common grounds so we bring songs of joyful praise and shouts of victorious triumph to God because He is God. We know it. We believe it. We say it. We live by it. And we're going to serve Him in His mission. Do these things mark your life? Are they characteristics of your walk with the Lord? The second part of this passage verses 4 through 5, they continue on this theme of an attitude of gratitude. Verses 4 through 5 say, Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and bless His name. Verse 5 goes on to say, For the Lord is good, and His faithful love endures forever. His faithfulness through all generations enter his courts and his gates with praise and thanksgiving this psalm is describing a psalm of praise through sacrificial worship of god entering the gates of the tabernacle into the courtyard or or, or entering the gates of the temple into the courtyard of the temple or for us you might think about it this way going to church Right? Well, this is a psalm of the temple in the sacrifice of worship and praise for us today 
we know that Jesus has fulfilled the law for us. And so now we have his spirit indwelling in us and we gather with the family of God to do the very same thing, to bring our hearts of praise to the Lord. And he teaches us how we ought to do it, representing this dwelling place of God and the focal point of Israel, using the temple as the example, the innermost room, the holiest of holies, the place that housed the holy ark of the covenant. Now in the New Testament, we as the body of Christ, we gather with believers to worship the God who is worthy. And we should be coming to church like this, with thankful and faithful hearts. The word thanksgiving, we enter those gates and those courts with thanksgiving. This idea of thanksgiving is a word that depicts worship. It's worship, it's, it's actions and attitudes and songs of thanksgiving and praise that extol the mighty wonders of the Lord. You can see this happen in Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 27. Again, they're a part of this idea of rebuilding. Right? And it says, at the dedication of this wall that's been rebuilt, that was torn down when they were taken captive to Babylonia, now they're returning. And at the dedication of that great and mighty work, the, the vision that Nehemiah cast, they sent for the Levites wherever they lived, and they brought them to Jerusalem, right? They sent that tribe that their inheritance was the Lord, that tribe that was meant to minister to the Israelites, that tribe that was the priestly lineage. They brought them to Jerusalem to celebrate this joyous dedication. And, and what did they do? This wasn't a somber moment. This wasn't a critical moment. This wasn't a, it's about time they finally rebuilt this wall kind of a moment. No, this was a dedication with thanksgiving that was driven by singing and accompanied by cymbals, harps, and lyres. There was a party going on. Friends, we need to come to church with that same kind of enthusiasm. We get to meet with the one true God, join and link arms with other believers that have acknowledged that the Lord is God. And we get to praise God because He is worthy of that praise. We should come with an attitude of thanksgiving. Thank you, God. <laughs> I know that there's a list of enemies of praise out there, but what's not on it is an attitude of thanksgiving. So I'm going to come to church and serve the Lord. First, I'm going to come to church. I'm going to do it regularly. I'm going to do it often. And then I'm going to realize I'm a part of the mission, and I'm going to serve the Lord. And, and finally, I'm not going to do it out of a heart of contempt. I'm not going to do all of that out of compulsion, but I'm going to do that out of gratitude to the Lord. I'm going to come with a thankful heart. I make that declaration today. I am thankful for what God's done in my life and what He's doing at this church. I'm thankful for my God, and so therefore I'm going to praise Him. I might not be a singer, but I'm going to sing a song of praise. This idea of praise, it's a feminine picture here in the Hebrew. It's a, it's a word that teaches us that we ought to come to the Lord with words and actions of genuine appreciation through song. It can be used in such a way where we are taking this gratefulness unto God and we're turning it into a song of thanksgiving. There's a lot of songs out there in the world. Most of the songs out there that I'm familiar with deal oftentimes with disappointments, especially in the secular world. Oh, to stand in contrast to that are songs of praise. Praise under the object of our praise. Praise to God. We should not be the object of our singing. God should be. Now, we can sing songs that tell a story that lead us to praise God for how He's been so good to us, how He's been faithful, He's not failed us. Yes, those are songs that deal with us as the person 
experiencing God in his goodness, but the object is still God. He's the object of our praise. In Exodus 15, 11, the CSB says this. It says, Lord, who is like you among the lowercase God, the false gods, who is like you? Hmm. Trying to think what that would even look like. Are, are any of those lowercase gods glorious in holiness? Nope. Are any of those gods reserve, reverved, uh, revered with praise? Nope. Are those gods performing wonders? No. See, this is a picture of the questioning. Like, Lord, who is like you? But it's a rhetorical question. It's a question that has the answer embedded within it. There's no one like our God. There's no one glorious in holiness. There's no one revered with praise. There's no one that can perform wonders but the Lord God. The Lord should be praised and worshiped joyfully because He is sovereign. Yeah, this psalm is couched in the psalms that deal with the sovereignty of God. So oftentimes we think about the sovereignty of God in our circumstances. We've got to accept them, good or bad, because God's sovereign. He's got a plan. Just like last week when we looked at Psalm 91, we said, God can, God does, God has, God will, but God doesn't always do Psalm 91 unless it's within His will, right? And so we are looking at this idea of dealing with circumstances and God's sovereign over those circumstances. And whether we like it or not, we have to trust in His plan. Trust that what He allows to happen, what He directs to happen, accomplishes His will. His will. But this psalm right here teaches us that the Lord is to be praised because of that sovereignty. He's to be praised not because we get what we want when we pray to God and He answers us the way we want Him to when we ask Him, but no, because He's sovereign. Regardless of the outcome, we praise God because we know in His sovereignty, He is still good. He's always good. And so we thankfully come before the Lord and praise Him because He is sovereign. It shows us that He's the Creator. He's the one who we have been entrusted to. We're His. If we're found in Christ, we're part of His family. We're in His pasture. We're His sheep. He's our shepherd. He is sovereign. And so He is to be praised. And He is also to be praised because of His goodness and His faithfulness, and His love. Do you see those three things here in Psalms 100, verses 4 and 5? Verse 5 says He's good, and He's faithful, and He's loving. It says, for the Lord is good. His faithful love endures. For, for how long? Forever. His faithfulness. What was that that endures? Yeah, it's His faithful love. He is good. He shows that he's good by his faithful love enduring forever throughout all generations, the ones before us, the ones in the present, and the ones to follow us. The Lord is good, and he is faithful, and his love endures forever. Because of this, we serve God. Because of this, we praise God. This psalm is simple. It teaches us why we serve the Lord and why we praise the Lord. Because He's good. He's faithful. He is loving. He is sovereign. How do we do it? We do it with hearts of gratitude. Thanksgiving unto the Lord. There's a lot of ways we could go about praising God. But the thrust of this passage says, be thankful, serve the Lord, and praise the Lord. So friends, are you going to church? Are you serving at church? Are, are you faithful in those areas? And as you go to church, do you have a, a sour face? Do you have um, 
a critical heart? Do you have a list of expectations that we're not meeting that you come into worshiping God with? Because if you do, you won't be able to praise Him with authenticity and genuine love. You've got to come with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving will squash those areas in your life. Those areas may need to be worked through and worked out. Talk to the pastor. Talk to someone in your church that's trusted, but come with an attitude of gratitude. I found many years ago when we tested a bunch of churches, there was a few-month period where I didn't work at the previous church, and we really didn't have enough people on our core team to call it a church. So the people we did have on the core team, we said, let's go to a bunch of different churches for a few months, small churches and big churches and different denominations. And I want you to go and experience things that you've never seen before or maybe subjected yourself to before. Go to Bible-based churches for sure. You don't want to get outside of those parameters, but go as as a guest. See what it's like being a newcomer into these new environments. And I walked away with a lot of things that have helped me, and maybe we should rethink about the first time we came to Anchor, that it could really help you as well as you welcome in new guests, because there's new guests that come all of the time. But you know what I walked away with? I can praise God anywhere, any environment. It's available to me. It just depends on whether I want to be thankful or not. So go to church, serve the Lord. When you come to church, come with a thankful heart and go to church to praise God. He's worthy. Go to serve and go to praise. And may the foundation of why you do what you do rest in gratitude to God for His sovereignty over salvation and over your life. Heavenly Father, we come to you today, Lord. We're thankful for this psalm of victory, this psalm of joy, this psalm of praise. God, oh, let us take the directives that are given to us here and let us remember that you're enthroned in heaven, you're sovereign, you rule and reign, and we're on your mission, we're not on our mission. So may we serve you and praise you with glad and sincere hearts, full of thanksgiving, to you for what you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, if you're looking for a couple of next steps for you, you might want to go to our webpage and go to anchorchurch.com and click on the North Campus, and you might want to take a look at areas to serve the Lord. Or maybe you need to send an email and, and work out some things and talk through some things in your life and get some things situationally right in your heart so that you can come with an attitude of gratitude to the Lord. Whatever the, God, whatever the Lord's teaching, whatever God's teaching you today, don't delay. Act on it now. You'll find yourself feeling much more appreciative to the environment that the Lord's placed you in if you will do that, if you'll clear those distractions and you'll stay dedicated to the simplicity of this mission here of being thankful in your praise and your service to the Lord. So glad that you listened to this sermon. And I pray you'll stick around and worship God because He's worthy of our praise. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea. Our God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout.
Shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord 